Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, Simon Etherton. I am the Senior Academic Manager for the British Council in Chennai uh, for South India. Um, I, it's my great uh, pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Um, this is uh, Jirgari Shivakumar. Um, she is an associate professor from the M NMKRV College for Women in Bangalore. And she's going to be presenting on some really interesting case study that she's been conducting over the last more than six years. Um, I, uh, I asked specifically to introduce uh, Joe Gary because last year at the conference, you might remember that we were on the same debate. <laughs> and, um, and it was a great pleasure to work with her then. And it's a great pleasure to be back with her today. So um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy her talk. Um, if we have any questions, can we save them to the end, please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Good afternoon, everybody present here. I'm really happy to see a lot of faces, familiar faces, my friends around. And uh, without much wasting of time, I'd like to begin with uh, what I want to present. The presentation is called Streaming of Students, How to Promote Social Justice and Inclusivity. Of course, this is not precepts that I'm going to give. Uh, if I had an opportunity, I would have made it into a question. How can we? Or how do you think we could? But I just kept it this way for want of uh, space, maybe, the 32 letters that they had said we could use. So this is to do with an institutional initiative taken by my institution, that is NMKRV College for Women. And it's an, inst it's an initiative for an academic change that we, in the Department of English, brought about once our college gained autonomy in 2006. Our college has been there from 1973, and uh, in 2006, we got academic, uh, we got autonomous, we became an autonomous institution, and with that, we got a lot of academic freedom. And we thought, this is the best time to do something where we would be hopefully catering to the needs of our students. And so we thought, we would come up with a syllabus that would probably be a bridge between what we were doing earlier and what we wanted to do. And if you look at the title, it seems controversial because I have vetted through quite a few friends of mine. And the first thing they said is, how can you ever talk about streaming as being part of social justice and inclusivity? And uh, the rest of my paper, I hope, presentation, I hope, will um, help us, help me, and uh, I hope I can convey to you the understanding that I have about social justice and inclusivity. So this is NMKRV College for Women in Bangalore. It's a women's college. We teach BA, BSc, BCom, BBM students. And uh, we have students, uh, yes, this is what I want to do. Hopefully, at the end of, by the end of this presentation, uh, we, I think I would have been able to look at a few pedagogical, ethical, and social implications of what we mean by streaming for students. So this is, okay, I seem to be pressing the wrong one. Yes. Um, this is what I have understood of the word streaming. Streaming, as we all know, is to organize pupils by their academic ability into groups for certain subjects or classes. And inclusivity would be not being discriminatory, or excluding any group based on, here I've looked at it as pupils' ability or section of society. A quick look at the literature, and the, a literature survey will tell us that streaming allows teachers to be better direct their lessons towards specific ability levels of students in the classroom. It meets the uh, needs for students and students' expectation, especially uh, to be interacting with their intellectual peers it prevents a possible lowering of self-esteem that could result from comparisons with the work of higher ability students. Having said that, we in our department were very aware that streaming was considered as an elitist concept where there was a privileging of a few over the others. And this was something we did not want to do in our college. Our college has always prided itself on being socially just, in fact, we have this policy of 
first come first served basis where we have no cutoff marks, we don't have any cutoff percentage, we don't say only people above 80%, 90% are allowed admission into our college. We allow everybody to come into our college, of course, till the seats are full. So with that ideology in mind, we could not definitely come up with any kind of streaming where there would be segregation. Yet, as teachers of English, we had been preoccupied with the huge disparity that we have in our students. Uh, this is the profile of our students. Uh, we have students from different backgrounds, uh, ICSC, CBSC, English medium and regional, primarily Kannada medium students, and with vari varying linguistic ability. Most of our students are first generation learners, socioeconomically backward as well. Quite a few of them are from other levels of society. They are multicultural and multilingual, and we do have a few who are visually and physically challenged. So this is the kind of, I'm sure it's a typical scenario of any undergraduate college in India. And we knew that uh, we value heterogeneity. We value the kind of interaction that can happen in, in, hetero, in a heterogeneous class. At the same time, we felt that sometimes the disparity is a little too much. So we wondered what we could do to make heterogeneity more manageable in our classrooms. And so we arrived at, uh, this was the kind of questions that we started with when we started uh, streaming in 2006. We were three of us at that point of time, four of us, Mrs. Hemlata John, Lakshmi Chandrasekhar, Manu Chakravati, and me. And we wondered what kind of streaming might meet the needs of students to be with their intellectual peers. Because if they are with people who always, you know, like a jack-in-the-box stand up and answer questions, they stop answering. So we wanted some control there. And what is it that, what kind of streaming would provide equal opportunities in the classroom to learn English, whether they are from regional or English medium schools? And how do we design a syllabus? I'm using syllabus and curriculum maybe interchangeably in a very loose way. But how do we design a syllabus which values the existing literary and linguistic ability of our students? And Will the kind of streaming that we finally come up with, will it be able to contest the elitist tag that is associated with streaming? So this was the question that we had in our mind before we came up with streaming. So we began with a diagnostic or a proficiency test uh, where we had uh, all aspects of the language, which ended with a kind of a paragraph writing with a, maybe a little bit of guided composition, reading comprehension. And then we divided our students into three streams, E1, E2, and E3. And they were loosely now in retrospect. Some of the things that I'm saying now is in retrospect. So we realize now that it was loosely based on the CEFR scale, maybe between A1 and B1. E1, they are the basic users of the language. E2 are adequate users of the language. And E3 are competent users of the language at their level. That's important for us, you know. Given the kinds of students we get and the kind of expectation we have, can we divide them into three streams? And we did that. And uh, uh, yes, a little more about the background. Uh, in our uh, colleges uh, at the Bangalore University, General English, as we call it, is compulsory for all students, art, science, commerce, and BBM for the first two years, that is for the first four semesters. So for the first, first four semesters, they do General English. And so we divided the students into E1, E2, and E3 for the first three semesters. Uh, this is really the crux of my argument here. We arrived at a syllabus, and this syllabus had a complement of literature and language. The literature were, uh, we, the lessons that we had in literature focused on various issues like feminism, racism, anti Semitic, war, propaganda, and so on. So there were about six to eight lessons for each semester. That was one part of our general English, and the second part of our general English was language. And we thought we would now look at it in terms of 
the skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And if you notice from this slide, you can make out that remedial was a component that was introduced in the first two semesters, the first semester of E1 and the second semester of E2, and it was also introduced in the second semester of E1 as well. Now, why I call this as part of social justice or inclusivity is that what E2, the adequate user of the language, does in semester one, E1 does the same syllabus in semester two. And what E3 does in semester one, E2 does it in semester two, and E3 does it in semester three. And the most important thing is that all of them do the same syllabus in semester four. Because we realize that by the end of the fourth semester, by the end of the uh, third semester, all our students, irrespective of whether they were in E1, E2, or E3, they were exposed to the same core sub-skills in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And we came up with this idea of remedial for E1 and E2 first semester only. E3 did not have it. And we realized that E2, E1 probably needs it for two semesters. And that, again, came through a kind of um, dialogue that we had. And so we thought maybe remedial would be a good bridge for them to gain enough confidence. Right. So this was the syllabus that we had for reading, writing. From moving from simple passages to uh, where we get factual and uh, inf uh, inferential, maybe uh, uh, factual and infer inferential transfer activities only. Then writing was primarily in terms of right word order, reordering at the level of words, reordering at the level of sentences within a paragraph, and so on. Listening and speaking, please also remember that I'm talking about a typical classroom in our. Um, context where we have about uh, 70 to 100. Some of our commerce to classes are 100. So we did manage to include speaking and listening as well. And so it was through the CDs that we played or through the video that we played. So they would recognize common terms uh, of transaction interaction. And most importantly, for E1, they felt that answering questions and classroom discussion were important. So we. We managed to get that into the syllabus. The remedial, as you can make out, uh, concentrates on the usual form focus to begin with, but we also added vocabulary enrichment, idioms, and compound words. Right. So here, if you notice, the E2 syllabus, the E2 first semester syllabus becomes E1 second semester syllabus. And we now move on from simple passages to Retrieving information from charts, graphs, and timetable. So it's a reading comprehension where we give a chart or a timetable, and then we give uh, questions by which we, they, they're able to get the information necessary. Writing is at the level of identifying. So from reordering, we move to identifying. Speaking and listening, contracted forms, the bane of most of us in India, our inability to use contracted forms, conventions of politeness, and, of course, real-life transactions and interaction continue right up till the fourth semester. Remedial here moved to overcoming common errors. I don't want to use the word fossilized, but overcoming common errors, word formation, and use of idioms and phrasal verbs. Right, so the next level, where E3's first semester is E2's second semester and E1's third semester. They move from simple passages to longer passages. They identify the central idea of the passage. I put it very briefly here. And the composition has now moved from identification of topic sentences to paragraph writing. And the paragraph writing is based on what they had looked at in reading. Reading, they had learned to analyze charts, graphs, and timetable. And here was an opportunity for them to write a paragraph based on charts, graphs, and timetable, uh, whether it was similarities, differences, objects, and situation. Speaking and listening was in terms of 
what is essential information and unnecessary detail. And of course, we went into on the phone and face to face. In the third, uh, the E2's second semester is E3 third semester, as I said. And reading has now moved from simple passages to longer passages now to being exposed to different genre of writing. So you had journalistic writing, editorial, film reviews, advertisement, glamour, and medicine. Uh, more at the level of popular science, at the popular, you know, how an educated uh, user of a language might be able to read these pieces of writing. Writing went on to note making, dialogue writing, writings based on visual. So throughout our syllabus, we have visual to verbal. Uh, so we give them the visual, and then it is converted into a verbal in terms of writing. And speaking and listening were for note making as well. So if they did the techniques of note making in terms of linear notes, et cetera, they also listened to passages based on which they made their own notes. So they got, we feel they got used to the spoken discourse and the written discourse. In the fourth semester, all the, four, all the three streams do the same thing because we believe that they have, the, they have been exposed to the core competencies that were necessary for uh, them to step into e, uh, the fourth semester, that was necessary for them to step into the fourth semester. In the fourth semester, uh, we also realized that maybe we should uh, make them autonomous learners uh, in another sense of giving them how to interpret and read poetry. Please remember, when we've done it from E1, E2, E3, even the six lessons of literature are also on to what we do. So with the language component were the six lessons that they, that they did for the literature component as well. So we thought we would give them some of the tools for analysis of poetry. And of course, there was extended reading. Writing, again, was simple things like filling in forms, immigration, checks, rejection, summarizing, and report writing. They went on to other things as well, formal letters of writing, formal letters, report writing, summarizing. Speaking and listening concentrated on group discussion, because that is what was felt as most important by our students. So we thought we would use this opportunity to expose them to group discussions and the various things of bidding, taking turns, negotiating, so on. And the videos that we also showed them exposed them to the different accents that they might encounter on a day-to-day -day situation or if they take up a job later on. Yes, of course. Let me also add that the, the primary purpose of our um, syllabus is not just job-oriented. It is just to equip our students with the maximum number of skills that they could and to maximize learning opportunities for them, how they go forward is finally theirs. Right, so this is what happens in the fourth semester. I'd like to go back to this, just to make this clear. This is what happens. So finally, by the third semester, they have done the same, they have been exposed to the same core skills. So we realized that by the time they reach the fourth semester, they have moved from simple passages, they've gone up right up to understanding popular discourse. They move from interpretation of visuals to writing them in verbal. Writing moves from remedial to reordering to identi identifying, reordering, and to composition, composition of paragraphs, and then form filling, summarizing, note making, and report writing. And speaking was in terms of contracted forms, answering questions, classroom discussion, etc. Right. Um, since I told you this is about um, an institutional initiative, after having done all this, of course, there was still that gap. And of course, uh, we all know as teachers that it's not going to be 100% successful. But I must admit that at this point, our institution and our trust asked us what else they could do to ensure that 
there are more opportunities for our learners to be competent users of the language. And that's when we suggested communicative English. And we said, maybe two hours of communicative English where students are exposed only to speaking and listening might help. So finally, our students are with six hours of English, where four hours are devoted to language, two hours for the reading, writing, listening, speaking, remedial, and the other two hours for communicative English. And communicative English, of course, meant listening to CDs, interacting, group discussion, uh, two-minute presentation, coming up onto the stage and bravely uh, facing the audience and talking about something that they are passionate about. So giving instructions, understanding instructions, seeking clarification. These were the things that they did, uh, they have been doing for the last, uh, maybe now it's about eight years since we've in introduced communicative English along with general English. Uh, this is the analysis of results that we have. And of course, as you can make out, uh, the BABSC, uh, the BSC BCom are still in the 90%, while our BSC students have moved from about 60, yes, okay. Yes, they moved from about 60, uh, maybe 62% till about close to 90%. Yes, that in itself is a different thing. Maybe this is something we need to look at some more and see what are the other things we could do to give more opportunities for our BA students. We took feedback from our students because we wanted to know whether we were going the right way. Every three years, we get an opportunity to change our syllabus, and we wanted to know whether we should be changing. Every time we've asked them, they have said they believe that E1, E2, E3 is working. And so we designed questionnaires based on the syllabus we had. And here is a bit of a feedback that we've got for the various components that we'd use. Remedial, analysis of charts, guided composition, note-making, cohesive devices. And as you can see, E1, E2, and E3 have felt analysis of charts, graphs, and timetable. Uh, we asked them to plot it on a 0.5 scale. And all of them believe that that, that has been the most useful one for them. Note-making is found useful by our E1 students and E2 students, while E3 believed that guided composition has helped them fare better. The other questions that we had for our students was uh, the, re the listening and the speaking. So we asked questions on how they felt about whether they had enough uh, training for asking questions or whether they were confident enough to answer classroom discussions, clearing miscommunication, and so on. And you find here that E1 and E3 have given a point 0.5 for, uh, uh, they've given five for clarifying doubts. And E3 has given five for familiarizing accents. And E2 has given five for asking questions. So, and the rest has been four, yes. You might wonder why I've not included the ones and the twos, and I did a quick analysis of that. Hardly 1% to 2% have said ones and twos. And we have asked them qualitative questions after this, because we, I mean, we are aware that we are talking about quality here. And so we did ask them a few questions, and this was the kind of feedback that we got from our students. We wanted to know whether they felt streaming was justified, and we are very aware that when a teacher stands here and uh, distributes a questionnaire and asks them to fill, they're always scared and they'd love to give uh, on the higher side. We are aware of that. So we did speak to them in private sometimes, and we uh, asked them what they thought about streaming. All of them categorically said we should continue with streaming, though there were some apprehensions. My next slide talks about that. The positives were that remedial component, they felt, helps to bridge the gap between what they should have learned at college, I mean, at school, before they joined the undergraduate level. And they also felt that the difficulty level progresses gradually. These are actually quotes from my students, that the difficulty level progresses gradually. 
and more attention is given to students in a layered way. And they felt that they were confident to answer questions in class or group discussion, because semester four is to do with group discussion. And they did feel that all of them had an equal opportunity, because they did the same syllabus at, in the fourth semester. And it was beneficial for both L1 and English medium students. The apprehensions, of course, were some students felt, surprisingly, uh, E1 and E2 students did not voice this concern, but our E3 students seem to say that some students in E1 and E2 might feel inferior in the first few semesters, but they were happy that all, all of them do the same thing in the fourth semester. And of course, this is an in insight that we got now. Uh, most of them feel that the papers, as usual, since we are part of a, of a, of a system, we have to assess. An assessment is in terms of papers. We set three different papers. And most of them believe that our E3 paper is difficult. And we have a lot of people who, you know, who, who come to our institution as if it's part of their family, because their mothers would have been there, their aunts would have been there, or their elder sisters and the younger sisters. So one insight we got here is that some students deliberately do badly in the diagnostic test in order to be in E1 or E2, because they believe that, yes, they believe that uh, it's easier to score marks, the preoccupation with marks. It's easier to score marks in E1. And they felt that we probably need to add more training for students to attend interviews. Right. Having said this, they also said they still believe in the value of the kind of streaming that we have done. Right. Now, why do I, why do we in our department feel that it's part of social justice and inclusivity? Inclusivity is that first it's accessible. Students learn, like I've been saying again and again, they learn the same core skills, although at different points in time across four semesters. So what one stream does now, the same thing is done three months later or six months later. That is, second semester or third semester. And they were, they were comfortable to be challenged by their own intellectual peers. Although in the fourth semester and in communicative English, they do meet other people. Yes, inclusivity is scaffolding through remedial teaching, which I think is a pathway to equity and inclusivity. And, we, uh, and there is maximizing of opportunities for learning without any socio-cultural socio privileging. Yes, in the morning, um, in many ways, Rod Bolaita was talking about a culturally responsive pedagogy. And it was quite heartwarming to listen to that because I felt a kind of identification with that. I, I could identify with uh, what he was saying. Uh, we are providing, we feel we are providing a lot of learning opportunities for critical thinking and independent learning. Uh, for instance, it was students who came up to us and said they don't have enough exposure to speaking and listening, so can we give two more hours? And then we came up with that. We have changed the syllabus based on their needs. We've added some things based on that. And it is culturally responsive because heterogeneity is welcomed, but made more manageable. Right? And for us, we've always valued heterogeneity. And it's been made more manageable. And this point is another thing that I would like to draw your attention to. We have not prescribed any workbooks. We've only said these are the things that have to be done. So it becomes the department's responsibility and the teacher's responsibility to sit together and to collectively pool the resources and materials to be used for that semester. So this would be, as Rod Bolaita said in the morning, a CPD initiative to ensure quality in teachers. And that is an interesting exercise. The institutional initiative is it's a curricula based on students' needs. And the most important thing is, when our students pass out of our college, they are given the same marks cards and the same degree certificates without any privileging. There is no indication of them being in E1, E2, E3 stream. And the justification for that is, in the fourth semester, all of them do the same syllabus. 
So I hope I have been able to talk of some of the pedagogical, ethical, and social aspects of streaming that we have in our college. And the fact that we've been doing it from 2006 onwards, and every time we want to change it, people, uh, students have not allowed us to change it, and we've just added or deleted, means that there is something there for us. So I'd like to thank you for listening. And if there's any question that you'd like to ask me, I'm willing. I have just shared what has been an institutional initiative to ensure quality in education. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Joe Gary. I mean, that was a really interesting presentation of um, some work you've been doing, uh, an innovative approach, I think, to provide innov um, appropriate support for a, a heterogeneous group of uh, a cohort of students. And I think you managed to show how you um, coped with adhering with your principles of inclusivity and so on. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there any questions that anyone would like to ask? Well, I think we've got time for maybe one or two questions. Otherwise, um, you can always grab Jo Gurry any time that you see her and ask her some questions uh, privately. Okay, great. I'd like to thank you again. Thank you very much.